Good evening. Hi, welcome to our second lecture in our spring series. We have a real treat for you tonight. You're going to get to hear, uh, I've, I've seen some of this talk already, uh, from Andrew Wetzel, who's our first ever Caltech Carnegie Postdoctoral Fellowship. It's a really dream job. He spent uh, four years in Pasadena. He splits his time between the two organizations. And so this is, as you can imagine, uh, two great places to be an astronomer. Um, and uh, Andrew is working on a, a, a problem that has been around for, well, over 100 years, certainly here in Pasadena, and that is the origin of galaxies like our own Milky Way. Um, I like to always point out a little bit of history, so you get a little bit of history tonight, but um, Carnegie's Harlow Shapley, an astronomer we talk about some, but not all the time, uh, who was here 100 years ago. It was 100 years ago this, this year, in fact, that Harlow Shapley showed that the solar system was not at the center of the Milky Way galaxy. I have to remind people this, you know, as humans, we always like to think we're the center of everything. <laughs> uh, and 100 years ago, or 101 years ago, people still thought that the solar system was the center of the universe. So Harley Shapley mapped out this, the Milky Way and actually showed the structure of the galaxy and showed that we're actually kind of out in the suburbs of the Milky Way, and, <laughs> so to speak. Uh, and then, of course, uh, the following decade, Edwin Hubble, another Carnegie astronomer, showed that there were many other galaxies just like the Milky Way. So uh, that kind of started the, the whole study of galaxies in the universe, was started right here in Pasadena at Carnegie. Uh, you would think that uh, building galaxies wouldn't be that tough. It turns out it's extremely tough. When you see a beautiful image of the Milky Way, there's a piece of it there above our telescopes in Chile, and Andrew will show you some beautiful spiral galaxies like our Milky Way. You know, how do they have that beautiful structure? And this has proved to be a huge challenge for people trying to model galaxies like the Milky Way. And there was a major breakthrough last year with Andrew's group uh, where they actually for the first time have produced, uh, as you'll see tonight, uh, galaxies like the Milky Way, I think in a very convincing way. And so this is very exciting research, so we're very excited that you get to see it. Uh, Andrew is finishing his Caltech Carnegie Fellowship, uh, going off to be a professor at UC Davis, so we're very proud of him for that. Uh, and so I wanted to make sure we got him in front of everybody before uh, he left. So uh, with no further ado, let's welcome um, Andrew Wetzel, I think he's there, to the stage. Oh. <laughs> Good evening, everybody. Thanks, John, for that nice introduction. So I'm super excited to stand in front of you today and be able to convey to you some of the exciting new advances in our understanding of how galaxies like our Milky Way form. And I also want to try to give you a sense of the numerical tools we, we use now in theoretical astrophysics to try to model systems as complicated as a galaxy like our Milky Way. So you can see in this nice pan around image from one of our uh, recent simulations. Of course, you all know how complicated a galaxy like our Milky Way is. And so you can get a sense of how complicated our models need to be in order to model systems. Uh, like our Milky Way and like the systems that form around the Milky Way. And so uh, here's a nice image. You saw this earlier. Here's a zoom out. Many of you recognize this is Magellan, uh, Magellan Observatory, Las Campanas Observatory. But uh, I'm a theorist. I don't care so much about the telescope. What I'm more interested in is that band of light above it. <laughs> you all know what that is, right? That's a Milky Way, right? Name sort of gives it away. It's this milky streak we see across the sky. Essentially what we're seeing is the unresolved light from all of the stars in the disk of our Milky Way. And so um, the theme of my talk today, or the overarching question is, how did a galaxy like our Milky Way form? And how do we come to understand the physical processes that were responsible for forming our own Milky Way galaxy? And, and by extension, how we came to be. And so let me just cut right ahead to what we think the formation of Mount Milky Way probably look like, and I'll go back and explain to you along the way what this movie is actually showing you. So this is just an image of the distribution of hydrogen gas that eventually went to form a galaxy like our Milky Way from one of our latest uh, simulations of a region around a Milky Way. So initially you saw some expansion. Of course, that was at the Big Bang. The universe starts expanding. But then under the gravitational forces of this overdense region, the gas clouds come together to try to collapse. However, you can see as they try to collapse, there are these explosion events. They're quite dramatic. Those are caused by the fantastic explosions at the end of stellar life, supernova. In fact, you heard about that at the last lecture from Tony, the physics of the supernova explosions. And you can see in this image how important they are at 
driving these strong winds off of these galaxies, these bursts off of these galaxies. Gas tries to come in, but it just can't come in all the way before these supernova events uh, cause these explosions that dissociate the gas. But you can see now, as we wait long enough throughout the full 13.7 billion years of the evolution of our universe, finally, towards the late stages of this galaxy formation, the gas will eventually be able to settle down. You'll see one last big burst here. Right there, until finally now, these glass clouds will come in and eventually settle into a nice spiral-like disk shape that we think was responsible for forming the nice disk-like galaxy like our own Milky Way. So again, there's a lot going on here, and then the point of the rest of my talk will be to talk you through what are the physical processes we put into these simulations that allow us to make these sophisticated models. So, how to form a Milky Way galaxy? Well, we need to start with the building blocks, right? So the contents of our universe. So first things, we need to know what to put into our models to get the end result. So as many of you probably know, one of the great mysteries in astrophysics is the majority of stuff in our universe we don't even fully understand. So the normal stuff, atoms, molecules, hydrogen, helium, the stuff that you and I are made of, comprises only about 5% of the stuff in our universe. So most of the mass, or most of the matter in the universe is this dark matter. I'll come back to talk about that uh, more. And most of the energy in the universe is actually locked up into this thing we call dark energy. So what are these components? Well, first let's start with normal matter, which we understand pretty well now. So again, atoms, molecules, hydrogen, helium. So it's what you and I are made of. Uh, this is the stuff that we think of as responsible for the formation of stars, from re responsible for the formation of planets around stars. And then we have this more mysterious component, dark matter, right? And I can tell you what we do know about dark matter, but the problem is there's a lot we don't know. So what we do know is that dark matter is a particle that pervades the universe that interacts primarily via gravity. Well, we've yet to detect any other interactions through a dark matter particle in ourselves. That's been part of why it's so difficult to understand what this dark matter is. Again, it's not yet detected directly. The key is there's much more dark matter than there is ordinary matter. And, for, and, and that makes it very important from the perspective of understanding galaxy formation because this is dark matter is most of the mass in the universe, so it's actually responsible for most of the formation of the structures in our universe. I'll come back to that. And as I said, it's really key to the collapse of, of galaxies. And we have this third component, dark energy, and I won't actually talk about much at this talk, but it's even more mysterious in the sense that it's some energy distributed evenly throughout space. Uh, effectively, what it tends to do is it causes the expansion of the universe to accelerate. So it's like a repulsive force that tries to counteract gravity. And so effect, what it tries to do is halt the formation of galaxies. And I won't say a lot more about it, but these, the, the uh, to the extent that we understand dark energy, it does go into our models of galaxy formation that I'll show you a bit later. And there's, there's quite a lot of it in terms of energy density. All right, so now we have the basic building blocks. Now we understand where the basic structures in our universe come from. So we have all the ingredients. Now how do we know how to distribute them initially to let them form a galaxy like our Milky Way? So first we have to understand where does structure ever come from in the universe? Why do we have things like the Milky Way coming out of the Big Bang? So to take a quick timeline history of a universe, what I actually want to do is go all the way back to the very first stage. So we have the Big Bang here is some initial expansion of the universe. And then shortly thereafter, we had this uh, epoch that you may have heard of called cosmic inflation. Now why cosmic inflation is interesting is that it was during this process of inflation that the initial seeds of structure collapse were created in the early universe. And so the basic picture, which I don't have time to describe to you in enough detail, but just to give you a sense of it, the idea is that very on in the history of our universe, the universe went very rapid expansion. So rapid, in fact, that what were initial quantum fluctuations, these are tiny, tiny fluctuations in the universe, early universe, that ordinarily don't cause significant perturbations on our day-to-day -day life, but during this period of extremely rapid expansion, so during the inflation, the universe expanded by, by a factor of 10 to the 60, so that's 10 followed by 60 zeros. That's how many times it expanded in a mere fraction of a second. And from the perspective of the structure formation, why this expansion was interesting is it took these microscopic quantum fluctuations, essentially blew them up to macroscopic scales, 
and they got frozen in, and those tiny fluctuations became large enough to see the formation of structures in our universe, like galaxies. And then as the universe continued to expand and the structures continued to collapse, that's where the initial seeds of galaxy formation occurred. So starting from an early universe here where we have a almost but not quite uniform distribution of matter. Now how do we know observationally what the properties of the early universe were that seeded structure formation? We actually know that exceedingly well thanks to this. So some of you may recognize this is an image of the cosmic microwave background. So this is a light that came to us just a few hundred thousand years after the Big Bang. So if you remember back uh, when TVs, we had those nice bunny ear antennas and you, and you weren't on the right channel and you picked up a lot of the static in the background, a lot of that static was actually your TV picking up this cosmic, cosmic microwave background, this light that was seeded during the Big Bang and continues to propagate to us today. It just happens to fall into the microwave part of the electromagnetic spectrum today. And if astronomers look out into the sky and take a map of it across the sky, we can actually see these very tiny temperature fluctuations which correspond to small density fluctuations. So this part of the universe is just slightly denser than that part of the universe. But these are quite tiny, so it's only one part in about 100,000 from, from over-dense to under-dense regions. So tiny fluctuations. But it's okay that they were tiny in the early universe because the universe has 13.7 billion years of evolution to cause those tiny fluctuations to collapse under themselves and grow bigger and bigger over time. And so this is what the observers show us. These are the initial, essentially you can think of this as the initial conditions of the universe. Then theorists like myself can take those initial conditions, put them onto a computer. So here we have a very uniform distribution of particles in the early universe that I lay down to basically match the density fluctuations we observe. And now I turn on the computer and let gravity do its thing. And structures start to form. So you can see in this movie over the 13.7 billion year evolution of the universe, here we have these filaments forming. We call this the cosmic web because it looks something like a web shape as it forms. And it's at the nodes of these webs, these overdense yellowish regions here, that galaxies are forming. And this is all just under the influence of gravity, simple gravity. So that's the basic picture, and I want to give you some more details of how we actually simulate the universe on a computer. So many of you, if I told you I do theoretical physics, theoretical astrophysics, your picture in your head might be something like this. I'm standing at a blackboard. I have equations written all over. And indeed, that has been the mode of theoretical physics for the last several centuries. And it's, indeed, we still use tools like just equations on a blackboard as a part of what we do. But now, thanks to technological advances, we can go far beyond that. And in, a much more realistic picture of day-to-day -day life would be something like this, myself and a colleague, this is somebody else actually, sitting at a computer writing up code that basically is coding up these equations into numerical form that we then evolve on a computer to model something like a galaxy forming. So let me just give you a flavor of what the physics and the equations look like. Don't worry, there'll be too many equations here if they scare you. So let's just think about gravity for a minute. This is the simplest, in some sense, the simplest part of what we do. So all the way back to Newton, Newton told us that the force of gravity scales as the product of the masses of the two interacting bodies divided by their separation, r, to the second power. It's pretty straightforward, right? And so you think, well, okay, the movie I showed you before, that's just gravity, so it's pretty simple to model, right? Why do you have to worry about all this advanced, fancy coding and computing and whatnot? So it's all easy, right? Well, not so fast. The trick here is that gravity is a long-range force, and what do I mean by that is that every point in space exerts gravitational influence on every other point in space across the universe. So you exert gravitational effects on me, I exert gravitational effects on you. Every part of the universe has to interact with every part of the universe. So if I lay down a simulation that has a billion particles in it, say, I have a billion times a billion computations to do every time I want to step particles along. It's very expensive. So it's actually not a trivial problem. So we need to think carefully about how to do it, and we also need to harness the power of computational advances to do it at a level of sophistication that allows us to form realistic looking galaxies. So just to give you some sense of advances in computing power over the last several decades, this graph is a few years old now, but it uh, shows you as a function of year, going back to the 70s to the 2010s, 
What was the largest number of particles? You can think of that as just resolution elements. How many different bits do you have in your simulation as we're evolving, uh, as we're trying to simulate the formation of structures in, in the universe? So n here is the number of particles. And you can see this sort of nice trend over time going back, here's some early simulations from the 90s all the way up to some of the uh, state-of-the-art simulations as of a few years ago that were employing a trillion particles. It's essentially the record now. We can, we can do a trillion particles at once. This line gives you sort of a sense of the trend here. And we, and us in the theoretical astrophysics community have benefited enormously from the advances in, in, in computing capability. So have any of you heard of Moore's Law? Yep. So that basically is a statement that every 18 months, every year and a half, computing power increases by a factor of two. Now, one of the interesting things about Moore's Law is for a long time, it was simply that processors got faster, and so I just bought a new computer, ran the same simulation, and it ran twice as fast 18 months later. But as many of you know who bought in computers over the last several years, the processors themselves haven't actually gotten any faster over the last several years. There's sort of a different flavor of Moore's Law now. Instead of going to faster computers, we need to go to bigger computers, and we need to string computers together into what we call supercomputers. And we need to run our simulations not just on one computer at a time, but on hundreds or even thousands or even hundreds of thousands of computers at a time. Indeed, that's exactly what we do. And that's exactly the simulations that I showed you before and I'll show you in a, in a minute in the future, is we're harnessing the largest supercomputers in the world to run these simulations because that's how complex the models need to be in order to form realistic looking galaxies like the, what I was showing you before. So for instance, here's an image of the Stampede supercomputer. This is run through the National Science Foundation at the University of Texas, the Texas Advanced Computing Center. Um, and so essentially the computers we need are so big that we can't, you know, in, individual institutions like Carnegie can't afford to buy them big enough, so we need to rely on these national facilities supported by the National Science Foundation and by NASA in order to build these lar world's largest supercomputers that we need to run these simulations. And just to give you a sense of this, there's a website, top500.org, that keeps track of the, the fastest or the most capable supercomputers in the world. Here's the top. 13, and so the two that I'll show you results from the two that I've been using recently, here's the Stampede supercomputer here, clocking at number 10 in the world, and 13 is Pleiades, this is run by NASA, up at Ames Research Center, which is up in Mountain View, uh, this is clocking at number 13 in the world. So we really need to harness world-class facilities in order to run these uh, state-of-the-art simulations. And so, you know, I must give immense credit to the National Science Foundation and NASA for supporting us and providing these world-class facilities. And of course, by extension, thank all of you, the taxpayers, for helping to fund these national facilities, which we really need to make the kind of advances that I'm about to show you. And so just to give you a sense of how important these are, so a simulation that I'm currently running, I'll show you at the very end, is gonna require about 20 million CPU hours to finish. So uh, there's about 10, roughly 10,000 hours in a year. So if I just took my laptop with a single processor and ran it continuously for one year, that would give about 10,000 CPU hours worth of computational effort to use at a time. Now, if I tried to run a 20 million CPU hour simulation with my laptop, it'd take 200 years to finish. So I'd be dead by the time it finished. That's not a really interesting mode to work in. <laughs> and I'll say it's hard to get tenure when you're trying to publish papers. When you're like, excuse me, can you just wait a few more decades or centuries for me to finish the simulation? Um, so we need to think big, and so we need to use these supercomputers. So for instance, Stampede has almost half a million CPUs, cores, that we can paralyze up to thousands of cores at once in order to run these, these simulations. All right, so I'm just gonna break out for a moment and show you the results of one of these simulations. And so far I've just talked only about gravity uh, and the influence of dark matter. So let me just show you what the state of the art was in these, this isn't a simulation I ran, but this is a state of the art about 10 years ago, just to give you a sense of progress we've made over the last 10 years. So I showed you those big simulations before. So one thing we can do is we can zoom in on an individual system, a distribution of dark matter that we think is roughly where a galaxy like our Milky Way would form, and see what is that little patch of the universe where our Milky Way forms gonna look like. In terms of the, this is what you're seeing here is just the distribution of dark matter in this simulation. Right, and so you can see, again, as these, uh, through the force of gravity, as these knots come together, they form a bigger knot, we call this a halo, a halo of dark matter, and all of these little things falling in we call little subhalos. So this is where the Milky Way galaxy would form right in here, and then as these little, little satellite systems come on in, 
These are where, in principle, we could have little satellite, little dwarf galaxies forming all around. So you can see how complex this, 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 this uh, system is. Simple pencil and paper wouldn't be good enough to describe the complex gravitational physics of these you know, billions of particle interactions here. Is here we really need to use these supercomputer simulations to capture the relevant physical details. All right, back to the slides. So that was the picture in terms of gravity, but where things really get complex is we want to add in the additional physics of gra not just gravity, but fluid dynamics of how hydrogen and helium and all of the atoms in the universe interact as they come in, and eventually how stars form from those gas clouds. So let me just talk a little bit about that. So if any of you have any uh, background with fluid dynamics, it's the same physics we put in these simulations. These are the last set of equations I'll show. I promise no more after this, if it scares you. So if, you, if these mean anything to you of the Euler equation, continuity equation, the laws of thermodynamics. And basically, these are the nonlinear fluid equations that govern how gas behaves as it interacts with itself. So this is another layer of physics that we put in these simulations in addition to just gravity. And just to give you a cartoon picture of what the difference between thinking of dark matter only physics is versus the addition of when you add in gas. So you saw from that movie before the formation of these, these halos of dark matter here, and here's some little satellite halos here. When we additionally include gas in these simulations, the dark matter that forms these halo provides the overdensities that then eventually pull in the gas with it. So here in yellow we have the distribution of gas. But what's special about gas is it can collapse. It can radiate away its energy in the form of light. And so while the dark matter keeps orbiting through just gravity, the gas eventually collapses on down to the central region. And because the initial gas might have had some amount of angular momentum, you think of it just some spin when it was out there on the size of the halo. And because angular momentum is conserved, think just like an ice skater, as she's twirling around and brings her arms in, starts rotating more quickly. So too, this gas, as it collapses in, starts rotating more quickly to form a nice disk-like system. And that's basically where disk-like galaxies come from, is just conservation of angular momentum as the gas collapses on down. And eventually over time, as you saw before, some of these little galaxies that form way out here can fall on in and orbit around and eventually merge together. Galaxy mergers are also an important part of this model. So that's in terms of the gas physics of how gas comes in. It's also very important to think what happens when gas comes in and tries to form stars, because star formation is also a very critical element of these pictures. That's how, how we need to treat the way that stars form in a, gas like a, a galaxy like our Milky Way. So say we have some overdense gas cloud here, some molecular cloud that forms in the simulation, collapses under its own self-gravity to become very dense, and we have some regions where stars start forming. Well, one of the critical things we've learned over the last 5, 10, 15 years or so is the effect then that stars have on their surrounding gas. So they don't just see the formation of the gas, but after the stars form, they push back around on their surrounding gas, and they can be quite violent and actually disperse the gas completely. For example, I talked to you before about the supernova explosions that go off. Again, you heard from Tony last time about how dramatic the effects can be around the surrounding gas during the supernova events. And just to show you some examples of here, these are actually observations now. 30 Doradus is a star-forming region in the Magellanic Clouds. These are the satellite systems of the Milky Way. And you can see a young star-forming region right here. It's evacuated a cavity of molecular glass around it as the light shines around. So this feedback, we call it stellar feedback processes, are very important on the scales of star-forming regions. But they propagate all the way up to be important on scales of galaxies themselves. So here's a spectacular example. Again, here is an observation of M... M82, it's a nearby massive galaxy. Here's the disk of the galaxy here, but you can see these plumes coming off of it from the top and the bottom. This is hot X-ray emitting gas that essentially is getting lifted off of this galaxy as a byproduct of these stellar feedback processes, actually the light coming off of these stars. And so it's important that we model not just how stars form, but also how stars interact with their surrounding gas. It's very important to this picture of how galaxies form and how we get realistic galaxies like the Milky Way. And so that brings me to the new suite of simulations that myself and my collaborators just finished last year. We call them the latte simulations because we're trying to simulate the Milky Way through the use of our code. Our, our code has an acronym FIRE that stands for Feedback and Realistic Environments. And so our goal here was really to finally try to create a realistic galaxy like a Milky Way from our advanced supercomputer simulations. 
And um, before we go too far, I just want to give you a sense of what it's actually like to run a simulation on a supercomputer. So if you guys saw the movie uh, Interstellar, you remember there was a scene where the scientist was trying to do his calculations and he went to the NASA supercomputer facility, he took his laptop and he plugged it into the supercomputer. And at the very end, a little thing came up that says, you know, computation complete, good job or something. That's not at all how we do it. First of all, if I tried to go up to NASA Ames Research Center and bring my laptop and say, excuse me, I'd like to plug into your supercomputer, they would escort me out immediately. So instead, what we do is we log on remotely. And let me just show you how that actually works. So I'm just going to pull up a terminal window if this looks familiar to you. If it doesn't, don't worry about it. It's just a, a textual editor that we can use to perform computations. And I'm going to SSH in. That's just a form of essentially logging into a remote machine. So let me go ahead and SSH onto PFE. So PFE is Pleiades front end. That's just the front end server that lets me log on to Pleiades. So it says enter passcode. So then I get out my iPhone, because we're in a technologically advanced era. NASA is a very uh, keen on security, so I have to use a one-time use token. So I click on my little RSA Secure ID app and put in my password. It gives me a one-time use token back. I put that in. It worked, I'm in. I'm now logged onto the world's 13th most powerful supercomputer. <laughs> so now, now things can get dangerous. So let me just move into a directory of a simulation I'm running right now. So here's a bunch of files that store various things. And what I've done here is I've created a file. It's a Python script, if that means anything to you. It's just a way of, of sort of having pre-compiled rules to the supercomputer about how to do things. In fact, we can take a look at it if you want. Here's what it looks like. So there's a bunch of text here. This is basically just telling you, telling, telling the supercomputer that I want to use 256 nodes. Each node has 20 uh, CPUs or 20 cores. That's a grand total of 5,120 computers I'm using simultaneously. I'm going to submit to a wall time of 120 hours so I can run my job for five days at a time before I have to restart by hand. And then just a bunch of commands of, you know, sort of sanity checks to run which code I'm running on the machine. And so this is essentially all I need to provide to the supercomputer to say what it needs to do in order to run the simulation. And let me go ahead and initiate that script. And I just submitted a job to Pleiades. And I can even show you a list of all of my current jobs. You can see there's one that's been waiting I submitted a few days ago. There's the one I just submitted. So it's going to use 5,120 cores and the required wall time will be five days. So that's all it takes. <laughs> it's quite easy, in fact. Now, this is a simulation I've been running for about five months now. It'll take about one to two more months to finish. That's the one that'll be about 20 million CPU hours at the end of the day. So keep your eyes peeled the next few months for the first results that will come out of that. But let me just go ahead and show you, this is sort of not that simulation, but a, 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 a progenitor version at slightly lower resolution of what a, a, what a galaxy like our Milky Way, what its formation history looked like from one of these simulations. So on the right, you can see the distribution of gas. This is essentially hydrogen gas that you saw before. And now on the left, you can see how stars are forming out of that gas distribution. So again, the basic picture here is we have some initial overdensity. Actually, let me start it over again. We have initial overdensity in the early universe, very small overdensities here that are trying to collapse under the force of gravity. Again, there's dark matter here. You're just not seeing it. I'm just showing you gas and stars. These gas clouds try to come in along these cosmic filaments. But again, these fantastic supernova explosions basically sh keep shoving and heating gas around. And then from this gas, we're forming this pro progenitor, little proto-Milky Way system here. It doesn't look like much yet. And we hear of all these merging of little dwarf galaxies as they come together. But again, this hierarchical formation of structures over time, again, 13.7 billion years of evolution, that eventually go to form a massive spiral, disky galaxy like our Milky Way. So you'll see as it continues to evolve here, it's about halfway through the age of the universe right now. And you can see the quite complex gas physics that goes into the, uh, uh, into the dynamics of the hydrogen on the right. 
And as you can see, finally here, you're starting to see sort of a spiral-like morphology forming from the stars on the left. And it's gonna go undergo one last major merger right around now, and it will eventually settle into a nice long-lived disk. You can see the spiral structures here. You can see the little dust lanes here like you'd see in the Milky Way or like in external galaxies over there. So that's essentially the picture, at least a close approximate picture of how our Milky Way forms. And so let me just show you here a different, sort of different uh, visualization of this. This is showing the evolution over the last one billion years. But in addition to seeing the disk, we're gonna pan around in the entire system. And you can see the disk is here right here. And you can see in addition to this disk, we're forming these little satellite systems around here. And I'll talk to you more about those satellite systems in a moment, but just to give you a sense of the dynamics of a Milky Way-like galaxy information here, here's this Galaxy coming in is about to merge and become tidally disrupted. We're gonna fly in through this large tidal stream that's forming here. And now we're all the way into the disk of this Milky Way-like galaxy. You can see the dust lanes. You can see the young star-forming regions. You can see its rotation as it keeps orbit, as it keeps, uh, um, stars keep orbiting around the, the, the disk axis here. You see a dense sort of a bulge forming in the central region. Again, this is a level of complexity that we just simply couldn't do, just pencil and paper theory. We really need to harness the power of supercomputers to get this level of realism and complexity uh, for modeling uh, galaxy formation. So zooming on in for a moment, here's what the disk looks like. You can see it looks like, you know, uh, pictures of external galaxies that you might have seen, the edge on element, you can see forming a nice thin disk-like morphology here. And in fact, if we actually go into the position of the, where the sun would sit in the simulation and look on in, you see something that looks like that, which actually bears, I think, reasonable resemblance to what our own view of the Milky Way looking on in is here. So here's a comparison to the Milky Way latte simulation. Just to give you a qualitative sense of the sophistication of these simulations and our ability to get sort of morphology correct. So in addition to talking about the formation of the disk, I think one of the most interesting co components of these simulations is the formation of those little satellite systems that I alluded to earlier. And so let me tell you about why those are interesting and, and the mystery that they've posed over the last uh, decade or two. So again, zooming out of this simulation, just again to reorient ourselves, there's the Milky Way disk. But as I said, we also have all of these little satellite systems that form out there. So they look pretty kind of puny. They don't look particularly interesting or complex or uh, so what's the big deal, right? Well, actually, first, let me just give you some context of the size of these galaxies and how many stars we're talking about. So here's a picture of a Milky Way-like galaxy in the universe. So the Milky Way has something like 100 billion stars in it or so. The nearest dwarf galaxies, which actually some of you may have seen if you've ever been to the Southern Hemisphere, we have the large and small Magellanic clouds that you can see with your naked eye. There's a large and small Magellanic cloud. These each contain about one billion stars. They're about a factor of 100 or so, less massive than the Milky Way. Now you can't see these with your naked eye, but if you use telescopes, you can see even fainter dwarf galaxies around the Milky Way. Here's one example of Fornax. This smudge here doesn't look super interesting. Uh, it's about 10 million stars. All the way down to some of the faintest known galaxies, fa faintest galaxies we know of. Here's one example here, Reticulum 2, was actually just discovered a uh, year, year and a half ago. It's so faint that it took us this long to have uh, telescopes good enough to even be able to see it. I challenge you to tell me where the dwarf galaxy is there. You actually can't see, there's a few stars here, but there's actually a lot of background stars here, and so we need to use uh, sophisticated techniques to understand where there's actually a galaxy here, but trust me, there is an overdensity of stars here corresponding to a dwarf galaxy. But, you know, this is tiny, this is 500 stars, right? There's only, you know, there's what, a one, 200 people in here, so it's you know, comparable number of people in here, that's how many stars are in this galaxy, compared to the 100 billion stars around the Milky Way. So why has these dwarf galaxies been a big deal and a problem? Well, I showed you before, this is just a still, but I showed you before that movie of all that dark matter coming together and forming all these tiny little knots, these little satellite systems around the region where a Milky Way would form. And so if we go into those models, those simulations, and count up how many of these little satellite systems we expect to be there, we find a ton of them. There's like 100,000 or maybe even a million of them. 
Okay, and then we go out and look around the Milky Way. Well, at least as of you know, five years ago or so, in terms of the number of at least bright satellites, there's about 12 of them. And now since then we've discovered maybe a factor of three more, so there's maybe 30 or 40 of these satellite systems. So we have 30 or 40 satellite systems, hundreds of thousands of satellite systems. 30 or 40, 100,000, eh, that doesn't seem to match up. So that's frustrating. So it's called the missing satellites problem. Where are all the missing, there seem to be missing satellites compared to what our state of the art fancy computer simulations that include gravity include. Well that's the key, right? Is, so the predictions I showed you from 10 years ago were including only gravity. The assumption was that it was only gravitational physics we need to basically predict what number of these little satellite systems should be there. Well we know now that the situation is more complex than that and if we actually run a simulation with all of the complex gas dynamics, star formation, st stellar feedback that I showed you before, we end up with quite a bit fewer little subhalo knots than you saw before. So here's actually an image now of the dark matter distribution from that simulation I, sh I showed you before that includes all the complex gas physics. And you see sort of by eye there's a lot fewer of these subhalos. And then if I overlay on top of here, what the distribution of stars would look like in the same sort of color map and scheme. I'll just flash back and forth. So here's where the distribution of stars is in the simulation, and there was the dark matter. So you see they don't just map trivially onto each other. There's some regions right here, 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 and here where you expect there to be luminous satellites, and sure enough, you find them, but some of those little knots don't seem to have, sub, don't seem to have luminous subhalos. So uh, as of right now, I've finished running three of these different systems. So we don't exactly know the exact way that the Milky Way formed. So we run three different systems that have plausibly Milky Way-like formation histories. And we see what the predictions are because there's some scatter. And so here's the views of the, the, cent the, the disk galaxy here is buried in the middle of this image. You can't really see it. But you can see all of these little satellite systems sprinkled around. In addition to, you see these little streams here. Those are actually the, the destroyed satellites as they orbit too close to the Milky Way-like disk, they get tidally disrupted into these long streams, and they're no longer bound satellites. So I've ran three of them now, and let's see how they compare to the predicted, or to the observed number of satellite dwarf galaxies around the Milky Way, and around our nearest massive neighboring galaxy, Andromeda. So we actually, it's, Andromeda galaxy is near enough that we can actually see the faint dwarf galaxies around it as well. So what this plot shows is the cumulative number of these satellite dwarf galaxies that are above a given stellar mass or number of stars. So this is a, a billion, a, a dwarf galaxy that has a billion stars. This is a dwarf galaxy that has a million stars. So we expect some, or we observe some number of satellites at different masses. So here's the trend for the Milky Way. So we find 10 of these dwarf galaxies down to 100,000 stars around the Milky Way. And we observe uh, 23 of them around Andromeda. So here is, the predict here is the result from the first simulation I finished running about a year ago. It sits right in the middle. And then I finished running one more. Wow, it sits right on top of the Milky Way. And where do you think the third one will fly, fall? Really, just by chance, I couldn't have designed this better, I tried. It falls right on top of, of Andromeda. And I'll let you guess the naming scheme I've been using for these simulations. The trick is I'm only allowed to drink that given drink when I'm analyzing that given simulation. <laughs> if, you, if you don't know, if you haven't already guessed, astronomers really like their caffeine, so it's, it's very important for us. So I ran three different simulations of plausibly Milky Way-like formation histories, and I got the number of dwarf galaxies that sit right between the Milky Way and Andromeda. So they're fully consistent, so no more problem. So what was it that the older models didn't include that these new models do include? Well, as I said, the key additional physics is that complex gas physics plus star formation plus stellar feedback that tends to destroy a lot of the satellites that would have been there if I'd included only the dark matter gravitational physics. Just to give you some sense of this, here's two images of the same system that I, that I simulated. The one on the right, again, is an image of the dark matter in the complex simulation with gas dynamics, star formation, star, stellar feedback. And the one on the left is if I only include dark matter with gravitational physics. So just dark matter, dark matter plus all that complex galaxy physics. 
you can just see by eye the striking difference in the number of these little subhalo dark matter knots that form. There's a lot fewer of them when you include star formation, stellar evolution, stellar feedback than if you include only gravity. So all of, those, all of those dramatic events that you saw in the movie, those supernova explosions, and the light that comes from those stars, all tend to destroy a lot of these low mass satellite systems and essentially erase the stars that form in them. In addition, which I didn't show you is, when you're forming a disk galaxy like the Milky Way, a lot of these things that orbit near the disk also get destroyed by the gravitational tidal influence. So there used to be this huge problem of the missing satellites. If we have you know, sophisticated enough models now, our predictions are agreeing quite nicely. So we're finally getting, you know, not just the Milky Way galaxy itself, but all of its little dwarf galaxies are agreeing nicely with what we measure around the Milky Way, which is quite exciting. And so I showed you before, currently we're able to model these dwarf galaxies down to about 100,000 stars. But I remember when I showed you the examples of dwarf galaxies before, we observe around the Milky Way dwarf galaxies that will go all the way down to only about 500 stars. And we can't yet model those in the simulation because we just don't have enough resolution elements. We don't have enough fine-grained features in our simulation because the, our, uh, the, the computers haven't been powerful enough for, it, for, for us to be able to use them. But what's exciting now is that we're getting close to being able to do it now. So what I showed you right now is, is results from what I'm calling just the regular latte simulations that included about 140 million of these particles of these little resolution elements. And it took about uh, two weeks of runtime to get through. So the one I'm currently running now is triple latte. It's, you know, even more caffeinated. Uh, this will include a billion particles. And, you know, this will take quite a while to run. As I said, it's about five months in now, maybe about a month more to finish. But it's super exciting because it's finally going to allow us to start resolving not just the more massive dwarf galaxies, but essentially the full mass spectrum of dwarf galaxies that form around the Milky Way. So we can have a complete census of those satellite systems. And just to give you a preview of coming attractions, a sense of what this simulation will allow us to do, the simulation hasn't finished running yet, so I can't show you the predictions all the way to the present day yet, but I can show you what it looked like back in the early universe. So here's an image of stars from the simulation in the early universe. You see this proto Milky Way-like system forming here. And I just wanted you to compare it to observations of high redshift dwarf galaxies like what the Hubble Space Telescope might see. Looks plausibly consistent. But this is just showing how deep you could go if you observe this simulated galaxy with something like Hubble Space Telescope imaging. What if you could look all the way down to every single star that was forming around one of these Milky Way progenitors? You'd see something far more complex, something like that. So we can now start to make predictions for what next generations of large space telescopes might see if they can look super deep. And you can see all the rich structures. You can even start to see the filamentary structure already in the stars forming in the simulation. So there's a lot of cool stuff we'll be able to do with this next generation simulation. So I've come to the end of my talk. Hopefully I've given you some sense of the excitement with which our ability to use uh, you know, advances in computational resources and what our colleagues in Silicon Valley are giving us in terms of ability to use larger and larger supercomputers to numerically model complex problems in astrophysics. And what's so exciting is we can start with the initial conditions of the universe as probed through, say, the cosmic microwave background. We can use those to, to run simulations that start off with you know, conditions of the early universe and then uh, simulate the complex nonlinear gravitational collapse processes that give rise to the cosmic web within which, in the nodes, we have these little halos, zooming in on of which we have all these halos coming together through these mergers that get bigger and bigger over time. And now we can even include the complex gas dynamical processes that don't just see the gravitational dark matter physics, but that actually give rise to the dissipative collapse of gas into molecular clouds, in which we can actually start to form stars. And as the stars form, we can finally now produce systems at the present day that form not just Milky Way-like disks, but also, as I said, this rich population of satellite dwarf systems around it that we can really do a detailed comparison against what we observe around our Milky Way. So just to summarize at the very end, coming back to the question I posed at the start of my talk, how do our Milky Way galaxy form? If you take nothing else from my talk today, just try to remember this basic picture. We started with some quantum fluctuations in the early universe at the time of the Big Bang that during this period of very rapid expansion got in increased to macroscopic scales, got frozen in, 
and seeded in initial small overdensities that because of the distribution of dark matter in the universe got bigger and bigger over time under nonlinear gravitational collapse brought in uh, that occurred over 13.7 billion years, which dragged all that hydrogen gas in with it, which formed stars and eventually planets. And of course, it's, it's around those stars and those planets where eventually we formed as well. So I think it's quite an exciting picture and we're actually making a lot of progress towards understanding this full picture now. So thank you very much. So the question was, have I seen any simulations in which gas and dark matter completely compresses into one point, you said? Yes. So I'll say yes and no. So we know that this happens in nature. So if by one point you mean sort of a singularity, that's exactly what we mean when we talk about black holes. You probably have all heard about black holes. That's a region of space where matter collapses is so dense that essentially not even light can escape it anymore. So the simulations I showed you here aren't yet high enough resolution to be able to resolve a black hole. We can put in models for them, but they're not quite good enough to get all the way down to scales of a black hole. But we do think that there are supermassive black holes that form at the center of galaxies like in our own Milky Way. And so we're starting to put in models that go there. They're not, again, the simulations aren't quite there yet, but we're starting to put in sort of uh, simpler models that we're hoping we can eventually get all the way there because we do know that that happens in nature and we're really trying to understand those formation of those singularities. It's, it's in principle a very important part of galaxy formation. Yeah, so um, great, because the question was, um, is the additional uh, contributions from putting in magnetic fields important towards the process of galaxy formation? And the answer is we think so, and we're actually very interested in it. So I didn't have time to show you there, but we've started to run simulate. The simulations I showed you here did not include explicit treatments of magnetic fields and how magnetic fields grow over time, but we know that as a part of galaxy formation, we can measure magnetic fields in the gas in the interstellar medium of the Milky Way. So we've actually started putting those into our simulations and be able to compare what the predictions are with the additional inclusion of magnetic fields compared to simpler models before when we didn't include them. We're not yet seeing huge differences, but that's certainly an area that we're looking into because depending on what aspect of galaxies you're interested in, that could be quite important. So that's, that's very much work in progress right now. Yeah, so I did. That's right. So uh, the question is, do we form, I, I showed you examples of nice, spectacular, thin, spiral-like galaxies. Do we form, of course, we know there are different types of galaxies in the universe, including more elliptical or, or if you want, spheroidal galaxies, and do we form bars at the center? And I didn't include images here, but we do, we do find galaxies that form bars. And we are starting to find now the simulations that are, that are, that are generating a sort of more thick or, or a rounder elliptical galaxies. We don't yet understand, I, I will admit, we don't understand in detail the exact processes that drive elliptical formation. It may have something to do with merging events, but it, it's a complex thing. And you know, you could get a sense from these pictures is we can write down cartoon models of how those form. But you know, we really have to compare it to these sophisticated you know, simulations. And translating these simulations into deeper physical insight, actually, you know, it, it's a long, that's actually one of the hardest parts. And so that's also something we're working on uh, right now as well. In your list of computers, the Chinese had by far the largest. Are any group <coughs> in the United States working with the Chinese? And have you seen any simulations of the Chinese? 
I have not personally seen comparable to this simulations that the Chinese have done. I mean, you know, so there, um, the kinds of problems that really require these large computer simulations, so what we do in astrophysics is one, geophysics is another, trying to model things like earthquakes, climate modeling is another one, and then another one big is weapons uh, physics, of, of, of the physics behind, uh, say, fusion and fusion bombs. So there are a lot of, so certainly Chinese, China had the biggest one, although if you actually said who had the most number in the top 13, that's still the US. Um, I don't exactly know off the top of my head what kinds of simulations the Chinese are doing with that number one. A lot of the ones in the US though, you saw the top few were at Department of Energy National Labs, and so that's some combination of energy research uh, and uh, you know, uh, research into plasmas that have various applications. So, um, so I don't know what the Chinese are doing, but yes, they have the top one now, and so it'll be interesting if the US decides to put more of a emphasis on cyber infrastructure resources, and if you know, we'll have the biggest one in the next few years. I don't, I don't know what the long-term plans are. If you're running a simulation for six months on a supercomputer, I assume that there are other people running others on simultaneously. What, what percentage of the computer's capacity are you using? Ah, so uh, I think Stampede, I said, had uh, 500,000 uh, 500, cores. I'm not using 100%. So our codes are good at scaling to large number of cores, but they're not quite that good yet. So the biggest simulations I've ever run used uh, 10,000 computers at a time. So that's only you know, a few, maybe 2% of the full capacity of, of the Stampede supercomputer. And there are, you're right, there are a lot of people who try to use it at once, and so they have a complex algorithm for, so when I just submitted a job interactively, it keeps track of when I submitted the job and how many jobs I've submitted in the last month or so, and then it uses that to rank order me in the list of the queue. And then, so depending on you know, how big my job is, how many jobs I've been running recently, it'll put me in that list, and then it'll just wait in the queue until the other jobs have finished that free up my job to run. So it's also why we have those time limits. So I said the time limit was five days. You can't set your job to run for just six months and forget about it. They only give you, you know, five days at a time, and then at the end of those five days, you have to check on your simulation, make sure it's running okay, there's no bugs, whatever, and then resubmit it by hand. So this is the ways that they use to try to make sure that everyone, you know, there are thousands of other people in the US trying to run comparable types of simulations on whatever to give them access to these computers because they are a national resource that we do need to share. Yeah, so I should, have, I should have clarified. So Carnegie does have its own uh, computing and supercomputing resources. They're just not at this scale. So sort of depending on how big of the simulation, if I wanted to run a smaller simulation, I could use the resources that just Carnegie has at its disposal. But for very large simulations, there are typically, we typically need access to computers that are more expensive than typically any one institution has the amount of resources to run on its own. And so, um, and so um, the way it works is actually a lot like telescope time. Uh, we put in a proposal. So I write up a several page document that says, this is what I'd like to run. Here's why it's interesting. Here's how long I think it'll taste. And I'll, you know, I've, I've already done some tests on the computer to make sure I understand how long I think it'll take. I submit it to the NSF. The NSF has a peer review process, like with telescope time, like with grants, that you know, rank orders the projects, what's the most interesting. And they come back to me and say, you know, good job, we like your science, we're gonna give you this much time over the next 12 months. If they don't like what I propose, they may not give me any. And so it's, uh, it's, a, it's a peer reviewed way to allocate resources to where we think the best science is, but then I don't get charged for use on top of that. That's a national resource that is provided to scientists all across the US. Yeah. It seems to me you know more than it just exists. You, you, you must deal with certain properties, otherwise you couldn't model it. Right, so we make assumptions about its properties, and our assumptions are informed by what we observe. So it's, one way to think about it is the following, is we can put in different kinds of dark matter with different properties, and see what kind of galaxies they form at the end of the day from these simulations. It is the, the dark matter that interacts only through gravity. You could have a different kind of dark matter that has some interesting 
interaction with other dark matter particles and produces some weird distribution space. If we tried to put that in, we would end up with galaxies that don't look like what we observe versus when we put in the standard cold dark matter that we sort of what we think is there, we get galaxies that look like. So you're right that we don't know in detail what the particle physics is in the same way that we understand the particle physics of electrons and protons and neutrons. But we have, you're right, we have some sort of big picture idea of what general properties the dark matter should have that we put in. That said, these, one of the uses of these simulations is if I, if, if, you know, I have an interesting new idea for a different type of dark matter that acts in a different way, I can put it into these simulations and see what comes out and whether, if whether what comes out is ruled out by the observations or if it's consistent. So that's sort of the give and take of how we test new models of dark matter is through these computer models to see what's viable and what's not. So that's an, another active area of, of uh, sort of what we're looking into with these simulations. Quite sensitive, right? So, you know, I, the, the way this works is I showed you sort of one galaxy at a time being simulated there. What happens is I, I can start with a big sort of region of the universe right after the Big Bang, and I can zoom in on different regions to simulate, and depending on which region I zoom in on, I'll end up with a very different galaxy. I could zoom in on a region that forms a Milky Way. I could zoom in on a region that forms just a single dwarf galaxy. I could zoom in on a region that forms a massive elliptical galaxy. And so part of the challenge is how well do we understand the connections between the distribution of matter right after the Big Bang when the density perturbations were small and what kind of galaxy that ends up after 13.7 billion years of evolution. Um, it's, it's for the most part robust, but that's something we're trying to more rigorously quantify is how sensitive, you know, some properties of the galaxies are pretty <coughs> robust, so how many stars you form is typically a robust quantity. Things that may be slightly less robust are what's the exact morphology of how, how thin of a disk it is versus a puffy disk versus getting more to elliptical. And so the exact morphology of the galaxy can be more, does seem to be more sensitive to the exact details of the initial conditions. That's something we're, we're sort of trying to re more rigorously quantify with larger you know, suites of simulations. Yeah. That's right. My simulations often crash, so I'll get an email that says, oops, your job died. Why did it die? Sometimes I can find a bug in my code of, oops, I coded up that thing wrong. Sometimes there's just a random bit flip on the supercomputer, maybe a cosmic ray came in, maybe who knows what. And so absolutely, there are little glitches that happen, but we try to write our codes in a way that It'll see something looks weird. It'll say something looks weird. You know, let me stop. Let me write out where I am. Let me write out all my positions and velocities and everything, and say, hey, something looks weird. Email to me. Look into this. It looks weird. You need to go back and double check that there isn't a bug that got introduced by some spurious, you know, background, you know, whatever. And so that is part of what we do. Like I think the simulation that's been running for six months, I can't count the number of times I've gotten an email that says, oops, sorry, it crashed after three days of running. I have to restart it, make sure. So, but there, we do have built-in uh, sanity checks to make sure that it doesn't affect our results at the end of the day. No, I, not, I mean, so the, the basic physics is well-defined. It's the physics of how atoms interact, how molecules form. That's, we don't get anything like different kinds of matter forming that we didn't expect. The, 
the only sense to which that is true is, like I was saying before, it's, not, it's difficult to predict, predict, say, exactly what the morphology of the galaxy would be at the end of the day. And so in some sense, you can think of that as an effective or emergent property of the system that we may not be able to predict perfectly ab initio. We have to run the simulation to see what comes out at the end of the day. So it's not like new forms of matter forming, but it is like there are certain aspects of the galaxy that we may not be able to predict without actually running the simulation in the first place. Yes, so we do use random number generators at various parts of the simulation of the exact details of how we generate the initial conditions. Um, those tend not to be such a huge effect on the galaxy at the end of the day. One way of thinking about it is we're including so many particles, there's a billion particles in this simulation, that even if you have some point in space that use a different random number generator, it's slightly tweaked, it sort of gets canceled out by, you know, random here. So they, you know, they tend to cancel out. But, you know, that said, as I was saying earlier, you know, the exact, you know, does this star end up forming here versus here versus here? That is difficult to predict sort of exactly a priori. And so, we, we tend to have more broad brush descriptions of the system, like how many total stars formed, what's the total morphology, rather than point by point analysis of each individual star that formed, if, if that answers your question. So there is some, some, some statistical, there is some randomness underlying the model, but we know how to analyze the simulation so our results aren't susceptible to random number generator you know, differences. Yeah, mostly practical consideration. It's not like there's inherent indeterminacy in the model. It's just that when we try to run it on a computer on real time with efficient scaling of all the things, we need to make some minor adjustments and sacrifices and, you know, 100% accuracy versus just slight tolerances. It, so it's, it's, but I mean, that's typical um, tricks, shall we say, in making things run efficiently on computers. This one right here? Yeah, the, the one in top center, for instance. Yep. That does not look like it's running in an expanding universe. The filaments ah. of 13 billion years aren't going anywhere. So how do you fit the expanding universe into a simulation like that? Yeah, you're very perceptive. I, I sort of cheated here. Some of these are expanding. That one is expanding. It's just that I'm choosing, the, actually, I didn't create this. This was somebody else's chose to visualize it in an expanding frame. So you're actually expanding with the universe when you're looking at this. Just so that the whole thing doesn't take up bigger than the screen by the time it gets to, 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 to you know, the present day. Uh, it's just a convenience of how to, how to visualize them. And so that's why you're not seeing that getting bigger is just the size of the universe is getting bigger, but you're going with it. Whereas in the next one, if you look at the very initial conditions here right after I start it, you will see it's hard to expand right there, before it collapses in. So what happens is the universe expands, but if the region is, has enough matter in it that it becomes self-gravitating, it'll collapse back in. Right? And so that's the difference there. That, that's a good subtlety you picked up on. I know this is not a discussion about dark matter, but putting this all together, I, I think back a couple hundred years ago to the concept of ether, you know, in Massachusetts, we're thinking about are you using physics for conversion of dark matter to dark energy along e equals mc squared? I mean, how are you, you know, applying these two into the volume of stuff in your universe where you have 5% of what we consider to be matter as we normally consider it today that we know of, like yourself and the you know, yeah. world here? You're now extrapolating that by five times to say that's dark matter. Yep. And then how are you converting dark matter and Yeah, they are still operating under conventional physics. There's nothing, in what I've shown you, there's nothing particularly exotic. We could invent exotic models and run them, but in what I was showing you here, we weren't. So we're asserting that the amount of dark matter stays fixed. There's no conversion to or from dark matter, and that dark energy is just a background constant 
density energy source. And so that's an input to the model. And um, so that's all standard physics. Um, what's interesting is putting in vanilla standard physics, we get realistic looking galaxies. So we can try rerunning it, taking out all the dark matter. We can't get realistic looking galaxies. So in our model, it is uniform, and it, expansion is the same everywhere homogeneous. People have looked into uh, what is the back reaction or what is the nonlinear effects if you had clumpy dark energy that could be different in different parts of space. But as far as we can measure its properties globally across the universe, the deviations from uniformity of the distribution of dark energy, we have yet to measure any directly. That doesn't mean they couldn't be there, but we do know that there's a limit on how big they can be. And people who've tried to develop models that have sort of a nonlinear clumping effect of dark energy, uh, at least I have yet to see self-consistent models that can, that, can hold, that can match the distribution of galaxies as we observe them. So it's not to say that that couldn't be happening. It's just that I don't think the modelers who, who have tried pushing on that have yet figured out a way to do it that is consistent with the observations. And so I think at the very least, this assumption of uniform dark energy is a reasonable approximation, and we haven't, we haven't seen any deviations from it. We're certainly interested in alternative models that we can run that have time-dependent dark energy or clumpy dark energy. It's just that we have yet to find a model that, you know, there's some anomaly in the observations that it can help explain. And so I don't have a good answer yet other than to say that, you know, it is something people are working on. Do you think dark matter has angular momentum? And if it does, have you thought about including that in your theoretical evolution of galaxies? Do you mean does the distribution of dark matter have angular momentum as it? Yeah. Yeah, so that is included. So if you saw on the, on the top right there, you know, that as this dark matter is collapsing, right, so it's a little bit difficult to see, but there is stuff coming in on sort of circular-ish orbits, right? And that, that dark matter does have angular momentum. So there is, there is definitely a distribution of angular momentum in dark matter as it's orbiting around, say, the Milky Way. And that is, that is captured in this model. So it's a very important part of the dynamics of the dark matter. And in, in the gas as well. So, I mean, in these models, angular momentum is conserved for all the species, both dark matter and normal matter. Uh, if there are any more questions, I'm sure Andrew would be happy to answer them. Feel free to come up. We'll see everybody in two weeks. We're talking about exoplanets. Let's uh, thank everybody.